Hello. Welcome to our new series that we're beginning today on the book of Revelation. If you have your Bible and want to turn on to Revelation chapter 1, we're going to read verse 1 through 3 in just a moment. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike Hollis. I'm the preaching minister for the Palmetto Church of Christ in Columbia, South Carolina. And before I get into the message, I want to apologize for my voice. For some reason, it has kind of left me today. And so hopefully you and I can both suffer through this and make it all the way through, all right? Now, while you're turning to Revelation chapter 1, let me remind you a little background about the book of Revelation. The Apostle John wrote this to seven little churches in an area called Asia Minor, later would become known as modern Turkey. And he writes it to them because he's been exiled to a little island called Patmos, about 40 miles from Turkey. He's not able to get to them, and he writes this book in order to pour out his art because he knows they're going through some tremendous persecution, going through some difficult times, and he wants to give them hope and give them encouragement. And so let's begin now by reading verse 1 of Revelation 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. When is the world going to end? When will Christ return again? There are many people, many believers, who believe that the book of Revelation holds the key to understanding the return of Christ, to uh, looking at the times and deciphering when it's time for Christ to return and to claim his own. Is that the case? Is the book of Revelation written in order to help us understand when Christ is going to return? That's one of the things that we're going to be talking about here. But there's probably no book in the Bible that is the subject to more curiosity, more confusion, more misinterpretation than the book of Revelation and what I found is that for many Christians, they tend to go one of two ways when it comes to the book of Revelation, both of them being extremes. Uh, the first extreme is they become obsessed with it. There are individuals, Christians, who become obsessed with the book of Revelation. They believe it contains secrets to understanding the future. It's like a jigsaw puzzle that if they can put together, they can understand what the future holds. It's like a book of code words that if they understand the code, they will know when Jesus Christ is going to return. I remember years ago, I was watching an evangelist on television, and his specialty was the book of Revelation. And on the board, he had this incredibly complex puzzle with diagrams, arrows, where he had listed the events of today along with the events in Revelation, had tied those together and said that Jesus and his return was imminent, that Jesus Christ was about to return to earth. Well, it never happened. You see, there are a number of dangers when we become so obsessed with the book, a book like the book of Revelation. And one of those is that we tend to forget what our purpose is all about. We get so focused on an apocalyptic book like Revelation is that we forget what's really important as believers. You know, throughout history, there have been times when Christians have looked at their circumstances and made them fit into the prophecy of Revelation. Here in 2020, we are going through very strange times. We've gone through a worldwide epidem epidemic with the COVID virus. We have racial tensions in our society. We have political upheaval. We have a nation that in many ways is divided as it's never been before. And there are Christians, and I've seen them on Facebook. I've heard them talk about it, who have looked at the events and what's going on right now in the world and in the United States and tried to tie it to the book of Revelation and say, listen, Jesus, his return is imminent. He's going to return soon, and we're all going to be taken. Those who are Christians are going to be taken to be with him. Of course, you may be listening to this thinking, yes, I believe that. What's wrong with that? Well, the problem is that many times when Christians try to tie current events to the book of Revelation, they damage the credibility of the gospel. Because what we've seen in history over and over is that generation after generation have tried to tie the events uh, of their circumstances to the book of Revelation to suggest that Jesus and his return was imminent. If you've ever heard the story about the boy who cried wolf, 
you know the problem there. Pretty soon, people just stop listening. And I have some serious concerns. I cringe when I hear people say, my friends sometimes especially, that the end is upon us because of the circumstances that are happening in our world. I want to show you why that's not how we should approach this. First of all, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus has two questions that he answers. The first question is, when will be the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem? And the second question he's asked is about the end of the age, meaning the end of time. And here's what Jesus says about that second question, about the end of the age, the end of time. He says in Matthew 24 and verse 36, but about that day, the end of time, about that day and hour, no, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now realize that Jesus had clearly said before, I am going to come again. I'm coming back to this earth. As Christians, we pin all of our hopes on that. We believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried in a tomb, but that he arose again the third day that after that resurrection, he ascended to heaven to be with the Father, but that one day he's returning again, and that every hope, every dream that has been outlined in this book, the Bible, is going to be exploded beyond our wildest dreams, that God will create a new heaven and a new earth, and that all everything that sin has touched is going to be reversed. We believe in the literal, personal, visible return of Jesus Christ that he is coming again one day. That's what we as Christians believe. But, please notice, does Jesus say, listen, I'm coming, and in the meantime, I would like for you to speculate when I'm going to come. Uh, I left this big puzzle called the Book of Revelation to give you clues, and if you're smart enough, you can figure it out. And so I want you to try to guess when I'm going to come. No, that's not what he says. Instead, he says, it's not for you to know. All you need to know is that I'm coming back. You don't need to know when. You just need to be ready. And in the meantime, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I want you to spread the good news. Tell people about me so that when I return, whether it's six days or six months or 600 years, you will be ready. See, that's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24. It can be very dangerous. We can destroy the credibility of Christianity when we try to tie our current events to the book of Revelation and say the return of Jesus is imminent. We've seen that happen over and over again. So one approach that some Christians have is they become so involved, so bogged down in Revelation that they think of nothing else. Another approach, though, and the opposite of that is avoidance. There are those who just avoid the book of Revelation altogether because they read it and they think, I can't understand a word of this. I can't make heads or tails about it. All these bizarre images, these strange creatures of beasts and blood and bowls of sulfur and people eating scrolls and bottomless pits and dragons, the great horror of Babylon, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, war, pestilence, famine, and death. <sighs> Doesn't seem like a very happy book. I think I'll just stick with one of the Gospels. And so some people do the exact opposite and they avoid the book, which I guess begs the question, why study the book of Revelation in the first place? If it is so easily misunderstood and misapplied, why should we even study the book? That's a good question. There are several answers to that. And the first one, very important one being, it's an inspired book of the Bible. That's why we should study it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, we read, All scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. He says all scripture, that would include the book of Revelation, it's part of the whole counsel of God. As Christians, we need to study the whole counsel of God. Another reason is that the book of Revelation is very important the, the, uh, the, uh, theologically, if I can get the word out. You know, we learn so much from the book of Revelation theologically about the unseen battle that's going on around us, about the battle between the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. Revelation, like no other books, helps us to understand the forces that are arrayed against us and the forces that are for us. The book of Revelation is all about that. And also, the book of Revelation speaks to churches, it speaks to believers who have lost their passion for God. When John speaks the word of Christ to the seven churches that are in Asia, 
They sound so familiar. They, they ring true for churches today. Uh, revelation is often a wake-up call to believers today to be fervent for the gospel of Christ. But most importantly, the book of Revelation is about the victory that we have in Christ, and that is a lot of why John wrote this. He's writing it to these struggling little churches in the time of persecution, and we have to remember when we read it to keep in mind these first these words were written for them to read, and I think he wanted them to have hope. It's a powerful book. It's just too rich and too important to ignore. Another reason why we ought to read the book of Revelation, and it comes out of the words that we just read, is because they carry with it a special promise. There is, it's the only book in the New Testament to do this. Look at verse 3 again. It says, Blessed is the one who reads about the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written, because the time is near. Notice he said, Blessed are the ones who read it aloud. Now, why does he stress reading it aloud? Well, as you probably know, it's because in that day there were many, most people, by the way, were illiterate. They were unable to read. So it would be the custom for John to write a letter like this and for someone to stand up and read it in the presence of everyone. There is great power in reading the Word of God aloud. I encourage you to try that sometime when you're studying. When you're studying a book, read it aloud. That's the way it was meant to be experienced. That's the way it was written. I've done that myself when reading a book and studying it, and it makes a huge difference in understanding the book. John says that the one who stands up and reads it is blessed, but then he goes on to say, blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written. So the idea is, that you don't just hear it, but you also act on it. You respond in obedience. He uses the word blessed. And that word blessed means happy or fortunate. <laughs> now, even as he uses those words, I want you to think about the people that John was writing to. We tend to think of someone being blessed as someone who has good health. Their financial situation is, is fairly well off. They're leading a pretty good life at the time. But John is writing to a people who certainly don't feel fortunate at the moment. They're being persecuted. Some of them are even dying for their faith. Some of them are being tempted by false teaching. There are those who are thinking about quitting. Some of them are at least very apathetic about their faith. And John is saying to them, and he's saying to us, but he's saying to them, if you read this book and you keep working away at doing what it says, you're going to be blessed by God. Now, what he doesn't mean by that is that all their circumstances are going to turn out the way that they wanted them to, that all of their problems will suddenly disappear. What it means is they're going to learn to live in the power and the presence of the Almighty God, that they'll learn to live in such a way that even in the midst of persecution, when Christ returns again, he's going to be able to say to them, well done. That's the promise. It's the only book in the New Testament that carries this kind of promise. And of course, that right there ought to be enough, right? To motivate us to study it. But there's another reason to study the book of Revelation, and that is that it'll make us better students of the Word, better students of the Bible. And the technical word for that is hermeneutics, which since, simply means the science of interpretation. Studying this book is going to help us learn how to better interpret and better study Scripture. Because the challenge is, anytime you read a 2,000-year-old letter, to understand the gap between you and the writer, and that's true even between the writer and his recipients, those that he's writing to. I mean, we know that anytime communication takes place, there's often a gap between the speaker and the hearer. I certainly know that as a preacher. If you're married, you know that, right? Husbands and wives say amen. There's often a gap between the speaker and the hearer. And so the purpose of hermeneutics, of the science of interpretation, is to help us bridge that gap between the writer and the receiver and to try to minimize the distortion. And that's really important for those of us who believe in the authority of Scripture. We want to minimize the distortion. We want to understand what was really meant to those that it was first written to. Then we don't go into all kinds of bizarre situations with the book of Revelation, if we understand it that way. So with that, 
there are several important things to remember when it comes to hermeneutics, the science of interpreting scripture. And the first one is this, that the book of Revelation, that when we read it, we're reading an apocalypse. Apocalypse refers to the genre of scripture. We know that within scripture, there are historical genre. The book of Luke, the book of Acts are an example of that. The physician Luke writes these historical accounts to a man by the name of Theophilus to record the life of Jesus Christ and then in the book of Acts to record the life of the church. And so we read that as kind of a historical document. We know that there's a genre of poetry in the Bible. The book of Psalms is an example of that. So we read it with that in mind. But Revelation is apocalypse genre. So it's not history, it's not poetry, it's not really even letter, although it contains portion of that. It's apocalypse, which was a very popular genre uh, in about 200 years before Christ and 200 years after. We have a lot of examples of apocalyptic literature outside the Bible, but we also have examples within the Bible beside the book of Revelation. As we get into Revelation, we'll see a couple of those when we look at the book of Daniel, when we look at the book of Ezekiel. So when we recognize that Revelation is apocalyptic literature, then we read it with certain expectations. We know then that John is going to use symbols. He's going to use drama to convey his message. Now, most of the time, they will be Jewish symbols and Jewish drama. And if we understand what those symbols convey, what they meant to that culture, then it will take us in the right direction. We won't head off in directions in Revelation in which we were never intended to go. And by the way, some have suggested, and I really used to believe this, that the symbols in Revelation were meant to hide the message. I don't believe today that's at all the case. Apocalyptic literature actually used symbols to get the message across in a powerful way, in a more powerful way. But the challenge as readers today is to understand those symbols to get the intended meaning. For instance, next week, when we look at the illustration of Jesus having a sword coming out of his mouth, when we look at that visual picture, we understand that a sword represented authority. It represented power. So it just is a symbol meaning that Jesus is one who has authority. Or when we look at a thousand, the number 1,000 in the book of Revelation, for instance, when it says that Jesus Christ is going to reign for a thousand years, what does that mean? Is it a literal thousand years or is it something else? We're going to see what scripture teaches when it comes to the year 1000. But please understand, this is what's important. At the heart of apocalyptic literature is this drama between good and evil. That's what apocalyptic literature is all about. It's the battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And it's ultimately about the triumphal, uh, the triumphing of the kingdom of God over the kingdom of Satan. And the bottom line is that all the symbols, all of the images that we read about in the book of Revelation is to portray that ultimate victory, to give these Christians hope. Now, another thing very important to remember is that we try to study this scripture through first century glasses. That means we're 1900 years removed from the time it was written. We have to do our best to read it through the eyes of the original recipients because only when we do that can we really understand how it applies to us today and what it's meant to say to us today. And so throughout our study of the book of Revelation, we're going to try to do just that. Which brings us to a very important question. Why did the seven churches of Asia need a revelation? Why did they need John to write this book of apocalypse? What was the major problem that gave rise to it? Well, the most popular and historical answer to that question is that this letter was written, this apocryphal letter was written because the churches needed encouragement in the face of persecution. And certainly we read in the book of Revelation about the martyrs that surround the throne that they were not only oppressed economically, but they were also in danger of losing their lives for the faith. And so the book of Revelation was written to encourage them in the face of severe persecution to giving their life for the cause of Christ. But there's also another underlying reason as to why the book of Revelation was written. And we see the key to this when we read uh, the letter of Christ to the seven churches in Asia. One of the most consistent points in all of the letters to the seven churches is the fact that they were being pressured culturally to compromise their faith. In fact, if you remember, only two of the churches don't receive a rebuke 
All the other churches, the other five churches receive a rebuke for having a lack of faith. And so it appears the most significant problems that these Christians were facing at the time were compromising their faith, struggling to live faithfully in a hostile culture. <laughs> we see that still true today, right? That oftentimes Christians across the world live in a hostile culture. And one of the temptations we face is to make our life easier to give into the culture rather than go upstream and face a hostile culture and live according to the principles of Jesus Christ. So perhaps the book of Revelation is not as much about comfort and hope in the face of persecution, but it's a call to radical discipleship that refuses to give in to the surrounding culture for the sake of respectability or economic benefit. And certainly that translates in today's world as we face an ever hostile culture, an ever changing world, one of the enduring messages of Revelation is keep the faith. Stay faithful to Christ no matter what. Don't become lukewarm in walking with the Lord. I'm excited about the future as we get into the book of Revelation and uh, get into the meaning not only for them then but for us today. And I hope that you'll read ahead. Uh, read the rest of Revelation chapter 1 and we'll be there next week. We're going to talk about that. There's some beautiful symbolic language, some powerful language there in Revelation chapter 1. And so please read ahead and study. Would you join me now in a word of prayer? Holy Father, we thank you for the victory that we have in Christ. We thank you for the fact that no matter what happens to us in this world, that we know that Christ has defeated death. We know that one day he's going to return and that everything that's evil in this world Everything that's happened that's against your will will be undone. And that, Father, finally your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray that we as your people would remember that hope and not compromise with this culture. But, Father, stay strong. Thank you for every person listening to this video. I pray that you'll bless their life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us.